Herkese merhaba, hoş geldiniz. Bugünkü Dan Open'ınıza başlayabiliriz. Katılımcılara şimdiden katılımları için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ve sözü e, Sabancı Üniversitesi Araştırma ve Uygulama Merkezi araştırmacılarından e, Doktor Erik Tan'a veriyorum. Hocam buyurun ekranınızı paylaşabilirsiniz. Başlayabiliriz. All right. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending this talk. Um, I'm uh, Eric Tan. I'm uh, I joined Sunum as a researcher since um, May, and today I would like to share with you my research experience in the light and matter interaction. How we study the interaction of light and matter in the micro cavity and how we also use light to study the properties of molecules. So there were several different molecules that we have studied, like the, in this picture here, the chromophore of photoactive yellow protein, azobenzene, and etc. And uh, with this technique, we can uh, study the, uh, I will pick one to share with you since it affects the broad audience. And by using this spectroscopy te uh, technique, we can understand and learn about its uh, structures, conformations, and the dynamics by probing the ground and excited states of the molecules. And lastly, I will also share with you how industry uses light in the form of a laser as an enabling technology for semiconductor packaging innovation. This is a schematic of a photoluminescence uh, microcavity. It is an optical structure with uh, two mirrors that are used to confine light. So this structure forms an optical resonator uh, that can be used to study the light and matter interaction. So to generate a polariton, we place a quantum well shown here uh, in between these two mirrors. By detuning this uh, uh, thin layer at the cavity photon, uh, it enables the coupling of these uh, light and exciton. So the resonant optical microcavity uh, creates a repeating cycle uh, of light wave and exciton. And since this process is constantly repeating, they behave overall like a particle called the polariton. Okay. We use a boron dipyrometin, shown as this uh, chemical structure here, it's a fluorescent dye that has a narrow stoke shift. If you look at this absorption and photoluminescence peak here on the right hand side, uh, it is separated only by 20 nanometer. So the observed polaritons, when you put this dye in between these two mirrors, is described in the polariton dispersion curves. So the curves are extracted from the dips in the reflectivity spectra at different viewing angle. So the Rabi splitting. It's 150 milli electron volts indicated from the minimum separation from the upper polariton branch and the lower polariton branch. So we can also use an OLED structure, an organic LED structure, to study uh, this light metal uh, interaction electrically. So we produce an electroluminescence micro cavity. So it consists of an ITO, so indium tin oxide, as the anode. Uh, we apply a P dot PSS by spin coating, which is the hole injection layer, and the emissive layer followed by the cathode made of calcium and silver. Okay, so we doped the boron dipyrometin, as I showed you in the previous slide, with this um, PFO, which is a very efficient emitter in the blue region. So we would like to start harness the properties of this PFO and the dipyrometin uh, to via foster energy transfer when they are mixed together. Okay. In order to form a microcavity to generate 
polariton electroluminescence, so basically electrically. So we designed and fabricated a distributed Bragg reflector, which is a pairs, a number of pairs of silicon oxide and silicon nitride multi-layer stack. Um, so we de designed it to have a stop band at the 530 nanometer, as shown in this, in this reflectivity spectra here. And uh, we can confine the light and matter at this region of the emission layer uh, of this uh, organic LED structure. So in the end, we, we managed to fabricate this uh, uh, micro cavity to generate polaritron, polariton electroluminescence. You can, you can see in this picture here. So the, the stack of this organic LED structure. Uh, if we measured this uh, electroluminescence and we found that the, instead of observing polariton electroluminescence, we observed spectral narrowing uh, as shown in this uh, diagram here, in this graph here. So the micro cavity reduces the emission line width from 100 nanometer based on the full wave half maximum to the 30 nanometer and the peak shifts from 543 nanometer to 522 nanometer. So, so far I've showed you how we can use different uh, photonic structures to form micro cavity to study light trapping and light matter interaction, okay? Next, uh, I will show you how we use, uh, how we do spectroscopic study, uh, the interaction of light and molecules. I will quickly introduce you the background of this uh, method. So this is an example of trans azobenzene, a molecule that many researchers uh, investigate is isomerization from the trans to the cis form via upon absorption of light. Here, I would like to illustrate the difference between warm and cold molecules. So by cooling down the molecules, it allows us to obtain high resolution spectra if compared to these room temperature spectra. So with this, we can study the structure and dynamics of the cold molecules. And uh, we can also, you, if, with this experiment, we complement this with uh, quantum chemical calculations to, to simulate the excitation spectra and to interpret the properties of this, for example, this molecule, like its mode of isomerization in the excited state, whether it's because of inversion mode or a uh, rotational mode, okay? Uh, to complement this, we also have to produce a cold molecular beam. So to produce cold molecular beam, so heated molecules expand from a high pressure region into a low pressure region. So upon exiting this orifice, so the collisions, between the molecules have converted the uh, total energy into direct kinetic energy. So molecules are aligned and move in the same direction. So imagine uh, like how you come up from a theater cinema to an exit. So everyone starts to move in the same direction uh, very slowly. So the translational cold bath acts as a refrigerant to cool down other degrees of freedom of the molecules. So we can get cold isolated molecules uh, in the uh, 10, 5 to 10 Kelvin region, okay? So this is the schematic of how the setup looked like. So with a time of flight reflectron mass spectrometer, we were able to identify the molecule of interest and also the cluster of molecules of, for our experiments. Uh, besides, different gases can be used like helium, neon, argon, and xenon as the carrier gas. And the technique that we use is multi-photon ionization. So in non-resonant ionization, there is no intermediate state. So therefore, molecules have to absorb two photons at the same time. So in this process, very few ions are produced. And whereas in the resonant ionization shown here, there is an excited state with a certain lifetime so molecules can absorb two photons sequentially. So many ions are produced, all right? So by scanning the excited state of the molecules, we can record the resonance enhanced multi 
photon ionization spectrum. So as I showed you in the previous graph with the trans benzene. This technique together with the setup, we studied, for example, the molecule octyl methoxycinamate. So it's also called 2 ethyl methoxycinamate or the synonym of octinosate. It is a UVB filter that absorbs in the range of 280 to 320 nanometer. So it's thought to absorb this harmful radiation when you apply uh, the sunscreen and it converts into heat. So it is not soluble in water, so you can apply and go to, your, go to the sea. And it's found in uh, sunscreen lotion, lipstick, uh, nail polish, shampoo, and skin creams. And here, this is the RAMP, the Resonant Enhanced Multiphoton Ionization Spectrum of the uh, OMC, basically the octyl methoxycinamid. And from the confirmation studies, we assign the other two spectra as shown below to the uh, confirmation to two different confirmations. So since this has a very long tail, so it makes it uh, complex to distinguish the, because of spectral conjection, so it makes it difficult to assign accurately to uh, other confirmations. Okay. So in addition to the uh, bright state, uh, which has a lifetime of uh, three picoseconds, we found that, uh, and here this is an excited state of the methyl methoxycinamide, which has a shorter tail, so we can study this more thoroughly. So uh, this shows us uh, the lifetime of this molecule and the excited state is at three picoseconds. So in addition, we also found that uh, this lifetime of in, in addition to this three picoseconds lifetime, we found that the molecule also, upon absorption of UV radiation, undergoes an internal conversion to the dark state. So which has a lifetime three orders of magnitude longer. So here as shown here, 18 nanoseconds and 24 nanoseconds. So this dark state acts as a bottleneck to dissipate harmful UV radiation upon absorption. So just to give you a sense of proportion, uh, we have the natural pho photoprotectant of our skin. So it's called melanin. Uh, people who have darker skin, they have uh, different types. There are two types actually, uh, pheomelanin and eumelanin. And it has a lifetime in the, in the femtosecond range. So this shows that melanin found in our skin can dissipate the absorbed uh, UV rays better, multiple orders of magnitude faster and better than this UVB filter. So we found actually we, this UVB filter can actually do more harm to the users than to protect them. So and then at that time we received uh, many highlights uh, because of the research done. Uh, the good thing is we can now see the fruit of our research. We see how fundamental research can bring positive impact to the society. So I have here an old image of a sunscreen product. So there's no brand on it, okay? And it's in ingredient. So in 2014, this molecule was still widely used. And only recently I checked, the same sunscreen product does not have this ingredient anymore. In fact, it is now advertised uh, to be made without uh, this filter, okay? So there, there is uh, this positive impact to society based on these fundamental research that we have done. And lastly, I'll share with you how light in the form of uh, laser beam uh, is enabling the technology for packaging innovation. So this is the picture of a mechanical saw. It is widely used in semiconductor manufacturing uh, for dye separation. This is where you get your dye, individual dye or individual chip to be processed and put into your electronic devices. And here, this is an illustration to show that we can now use a multi-beam laser to dye wafers. So the advantage of uh, that is uh, laser is able to dye faster and dye different materials on the top surface with high quality, okay? We use a diffractive optical element in which we can split a single beam into multiple beams. In, in this diagram here, the beams are aligned in a linear spot array where the separation of each beam can be determined from the design. 
Uh, so these beams are uniform and homogeneous, right? We can also use the same diffractive, uh, different diffractive optical element to split the beam into a matrix form. So you can create as many beams as you want, depending on the design and of, of course the fabrication of the diffractive optical element. So with the multi-beam te beam technology, we can enable 3D packaging innovation. Here, this is a cartoon or a schematic of a chip, a computer chip, which can be stacked and integrated onto a small footprint, like uh, 15 by 15 millimeter. Yeah? The idea is to pack more and more uh, computing functionalities in a small footprint, which also provides uh, advantages like uh, longer battery life, uh, performance, and also fast connectivity. So this type of uh, product requires the laser beam technology uh, because the current mechanical saw equipment is not able to uh, fulfill the requirement of this uh, packaging technology. So by using the right amount of laser power we and further distribute them into uh, multiple beams, we can dice different materials with uh, good quality. Uh, this is a same image of the cross section of this small comp compound material. So it's a composition of fillers made of silicon dioxide, uh, different sizes uh, for mechanical strength purposes, uh, polymers and epoxy that cure and set at certain temperature. So it's a mix with a thermal setting uh, material. So the process of dicing it is basically laser beam induces melt with the epoxy and ejection of the fillers. So this image shows the uh, quality of the cut and the narrowest, uh, what we call the narrowest dicing curve that we can achieve is 15 micrometer. So in the future, uh, with this technology, we can see more and more integrated package uh, electronic chip in our electronic device. So we will get more and more smaller devices with uh, more functionalities. And for those who are interested in this work, we have published these two materials. Uh, and lastly, um, the future direction is Sunum. So we will develop an uh, optical based sensor uh, that addresses the needs in electronics uh, and consumer electronics, healthcare, and environment. So we will do the microfabrication within the facilities of Sunum and with other partners. And I believe uh, Dr. Jang will uh, talk about the, the facilities available uh, at Sunum. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge uh, these people who were directly and indirectly contributed to these uh, research projects. And uh, thank you for your attention. I think I will pass this to the second talk, right? Uh, hello everyone, um, I am Jenk. Uh, let me introduce you myself briefly. Uh, I did my uh, uh, PhD in experimental condensed matter physics at Sabanju University and I worked uh, between 2014 and 2019 as a nanofabrication specialist and since 2019 I have been working as a, a nanofabrication team leader. Today I'm going to mention about our labs, uh, nanofabrication lab infrastructure and uh, resources, our capabilities from the perspective of micro and nanofabrication and uh, our services. So, uh, um, so first of all, uh, you need uh, special rooms, as the name suggests, uh, the clean rooms uh, to conduct the micro nanofabrication processes. Why? Because we are, uh, we are fabricating structures on the surfaces much, much smaller than the dust or particle uh, around in the ambition air that we cannot see by naked eyes. These are already based on some international standards. Here, as you can see, ISO 9 actually corresponds 
to the ambition air. And in a, if you consider a one cubic meter space and fill it with the normal air, then you have around 35 million particle in the size of 0 0.5 micron, uh, mm, in the size of 0 0.5 micron, but for example, in, in, in ISO 5 class corresponds to class 100 room, the particle number reduced to 3,500 or, or in ISO 6 it's uh, 35,000. So we have all, also class 100 and class 1,000 and 10,000 rooms. So uh, uh, we can categorize the micro nanofabrication steps uh, under four main headlines or main steps. First is the, uh, the patterning and lithography in which you transfer your designs uh, on, onto the substrates. And here actually the, the resolution defines the technology for uh, optical patterning or you may need uh, some smaller tools like electrons to make patterning uh, in the nano size, uh, nano scale. Uh, so I will mention about the EB lithography system in detail. Uh, uh, so we have both optic patterning systems and uh, uh, electron beam lithography system. The second step is the thin film deposition on, uh, and coating. So we have uh, in our labs a, a state of the art instruments where we can grow up the silicon oxide or silicon nitride on, on, on various substrates very precisely. And we have also a thermal or uh, even evaporation systems or spattering systems in, in which we can evaporate, I can say, all the metal families and some of the oxide families um, on, on the substrates. Uh, the second and the third one is the, the critical step uh, is a wet and dry etching. We have also again uh, some special systems where we can etch metals very precisely in micron or nanometer uh, uh, height range and uh, we can also etch uh, silicon based substrates and also we can conduct our uh, wet, uh, wet etching processes in our uh, class uh, 1000 uh, wet processing rooms. And the final step is actually the test characterization and packaging. So we have a, a wire bonder system uh, in which we just uh, make bondings from chip to chip carriers. And we have VC prop stations uh, to make, to perform initial uh, IV tests uh, of the uh, chips and we have, as the Dr. Tan mentioned, we have an automatic Dyson saw where we uh, dice chips in very uh, precision way and we have surface profile, uh, profile uh, where we can just uh, inspect uh, the, the modifications on the surfaces uh, in the nanometer uh, range sensitivity. So here is the very uh, critical tool. This is actually a flagship of the micro and nano lithography tool. And this system is, uh, uh, is the only 100 kV system open to all users in 2K. So this system uh, is working under 100,000 voltage accelerations for the electrons. And with that acceleration, the electrons wavelength is actually around a four picometer. So, but these are coming as a beam on the surface and we have some, a few nanometer spot sizes. And the, the system's beam current range is very large from a few tens of picoamps to a few hundreds of nanoamps. And the system has uh, already an interferometric stage where it provides very less teaching effects, effects and you can make multiple processes on top of the other, each other with a less than 20 nanometer misalignment mistakes. So uh, as you can see, here is the resolution of the system. So the scale is around six nanometer. This is a, some special polymer called HSQ and exposed. So the six nanometer resolution is uh, already a 10 times, 10,000 times smaller than a thin human air, uh, which is around uh, uh, 60 micrometer. So with that system, so as you can see from the scale is a micron scale, we are able to make patterns on a very large scale on various substrates. Here 
the patterning has performed and with the reactive arching systems, uh, the, the structures are etched vertically, which we call the anisotropic etching. Here is another example with the same sensitivity, same homogeneity, all in the region. And here is a nanometer scale. So what we do in our uh, clean room also, we are fabricating uh, some special chips called called the nanoelectromechanical system sensors. So here you can see micron size and nanometer with a, a resonator actually. Uh, so one one of one of the uh, sorry yeah here. So okay. So what can we do with these chips? Actually, the one of the basic thing is using them as a mass spectroscopy. How? So it, this is a, like a nano resonator. You oscillate it in a, a, a resonance frequency. And if any particle uh, with a mass like delta M lands on that resonator while it's oscillating, will create a shift in the frequency as delta F. And you can measure that shifting frequency very precisely. And, and it is possible to measure even one mo molecule uh, mass with that kind of very sensitive devices. Also, we fabricate, uh, we work our collaborators and we fabricate the devices here. For example, we have shown that with this kind of chips, uh, we were able to measure mass of the 20 nanometer size gold nanoparticles in the high frequency regime. And these works are, are published in, in very famous nanotechnology uh, uh, journals. So here another example, you can functionalize these resonators coating some polymers and become, and these become uh, much sensitive for a higher molecular volatile occurring components or low molecular mass components. And in this study, we were trying to detect uh, some biomarkers of the colorectal cancer. And maybe you heard already for the time being we are working on to uh, detect the COVID-19 virus uh, with uh, our collaborators from Wilkent University with Selim Hanai. We are fabricating the chips here. Uh, these devices are very sensitive uh, I mean, to detect that kind of molecules. Here is another example. It's a nanogap tunneling junction, NEM space the tunneling, tunneling <laughs> junction, where we measure a quantum tunneling between these two teams and convert it to the displacement sensors. And in principle, these can work with a sensitivity around 10 to meter, which is 10 to minus 15 meter sensitivity. So here, what we do also, we fabricate quantum transport devices on, on, on various substrates, as you can see here, and we fabricate uh, some prop sensors, sensor for scanning uh, whole crop microscopy. Here also we are fabricating some uh, nano size bridge contacts to contact uh, some uh, isolated regions to each other. Uh, and also we are uh, able to fabricate uh, on various and on special substrates like uh, channels with a very, very sensitive uh, channel height and the size smooth was because the light is uh, going on these channels. Uh, here also we can make a various structuring on, on various substrates like optical nano antennas or, or, or uh, me uh, metamaterial structures in a large scale with same homogeneity and with same sensitivity for all the structures. Here I would like to show you uh, the, this study. Uh, so in this study, the study demonstrates actually for the first time a nano size silicon beam can be buckled in a controlled manner. Uh, with the cleverly designed uh, electrostatic uh, architecture and name space. So in this study, you just apply a uh, voltage between these two prop and here our quant drives are actually uh, are suspended and for the electrostatic interaction, these quant drives move each other and that creates a, a stress on the cylinder beam. And if you apply a small amount of side voltage from the sides, you can control the beam. As you can see for all in the real videos um, taken under SEM, sorry, okay. So I couldn't. 
yeah here uh, as you can see the left guide active and the beam buckles left and right actually here you can see the comb drives are moving each other and you can uh, see how precise we buckle the beam actually you can use this as a nano switch or uh, a nano switch or nano divisor there is a actually a, a more kind of a mandel uh, uh, physics uh, behind this it's be, it can work as a, a nano mechanic computer um, as well so this has been also uh, announced in the APS physics news as well so we also make as you all know the famous uh, material graphene so the most promising way uh, to to uh, to uh, grow a large scale graphene sheets is, is the a chemical vapor deposition we have a chemical vapor deposition system in our clean room and we grow graphene on copper or nickel, nickel substrates monolayer or multiple layer and we characterize them very precisely like optical characterization here is a stem image on on graphene on copper here we perform raman analysis to to understand the number of the layers and also we make a transparency or transfer length measurements to extract the sheet resistance as well so and there was already project started with elmas project uh, uh, so what we do here our colleagues uh, already achieved the highest resolution graphene based oled screens and uh, due to the, uh, the 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 properties of the graphene, you can transfer it on the flexible platforms here. As you can see, is uh, on the flexible platform. It's a graphene-based OLED or or a transparent graphene-based OLED because the, the just one layer of graphene absorbs the two percentage of the uh, normal light. So here also we have an equip chamber where we, we can measure uh, the signals from uh, low frequencies up to uh, tens of gigahertz uh, and with the uh, antennas uh, diameters uh, up to uh, 20 inches. And also uh, we have a very special laboratory in our facility. It's a quantum transport and nanoelectronics laboratory. Here you can see very special tools called cryostats. So, uh, so in these cross sites, uh, so as you all know, the absolute temperature is zero Kelvin, which is mm, close to uh, uh, minus 273 degrees Celsius. And in these cross stats, we are going down to temperatures around minus two point sorry minus 272.9 degrees celsius which is 10 millikelvin and these crystals have a spark conducting magnets uh, magnets inside which provide around 12 tesla magnetic fields so what we do here we create our chips and then make bondings and it's ready to measure and insert them into the Cryostats and perform very precise AC or DC uh, electronic transport measurements. As you can see, here is a quantum hole effect. So, and also, I would like to take your attention here uh, what it means to having a, a state of the art instruments. As you can see, it's a two prop graphene device suspended, it's in the air, and this is also two prop suspended device. But you can realize the dirt on, on this. Uh, uh, device and there, there is already no dirt on this because this has been done through many processes where we were not be able to write all the things in one step but after having that uh, state-of-the-art instruments like EBLE electron beam lithography system we can reduce the number of the steps and we can have a very clean device because it's not always the case uh, the ultimate process uh, ultimate object is not always the case to have a, a structure it's also important to have a clean system because you may not be able to clean that kind of devices in in a common ways like a performing oxygen plasma and etc uh, and also we have some services for reverse engineering for you can see from here we cut uh, from the quest section this is a, a actually a stainless steel capsule and in a, there is an integrated chip underneath that membrane. Uh, we cut it and then we make the material analysis and the structure analysis. Uh, this is a, actually a, a, a pressure sensor for rec rockets. So as a conclusion, we are 
uh, they are able to make any uh, micro and nano scale uh, modifications on various substrates. And I can say that we are now in Turkey in a leading position to, uh, to provide services uh, like uh, in custom design device fabrication, especially in, in nano scale. And also we provide some reverse engineering. And with our uh, very special uh, laboratories at our laboratories we can test the devices in in extreme conditions like in extremely low temperatures or in the presence of extremely high magnetic fields or high temperatures etc so that's all i would like to mention about thank you all for your attention and you can send uh, for your request the email to sunum services at sabangenu.edu Thank you for listening. Eric Hocam, Cenk Hocam çok teşekkür ediyorum paylaşımlarınız için. E, tüm katılımcıları da teşekkür ediyoruz. E, zaman ayırdıkları ve dinledikleri için. E, so sorusu... I don't see any, any questions on the chat part. So if there, there are questions, we can get it, I think. Do you have any questions? Uh, I have a question to Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, can you, uh, I'm wondering, uh, did you work with uh, some um, terahertz technology? Do you have some experience? And uh, most probably you just uh, the produce generated the electromagnetic radiation in, in the infrared region, is it it? Uh, no, we did not uh, study in terahertz region. We typically use laser, so uh, so in the from the UV up to infrared region, so, mm -hmm. but not terahertz region. Yeah. Okay, and I don't understand why you split the B, uh, the laser to cut the the wafer. What ah, was the the reason is. Uh, Okay, this one I can answer you because uh, some areas are confidential, but this area I can answer you. Uh, this, we can, we, we split because we don't want to put all the energy into one beam. So basically you do not get, get good quality by putting all the energy into one beam. So by splitting it into multiple beams, so basically you are putting like, uh, splitting what you can distribute the energy of the laser into multiple beams so then you can dice with a uh, good quality so the, the objective is to get a very good quality curve yeah okay thank you so there is a question i see here thanks for Yes, uh, in the deep RE conditions, we can go down to minus 30 degrees, but we don't have a cryo system like liquid nitrogen. Uh, but we were able to perform that processes between minus 30 and up to, I think, a few tens of degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it possible to use natural protein as a thin layer of photolithography? Yeah. I didn't get the question very well. Is it possible to use natural protein as a thin layer for photolithographic method? So, I mean, the, what do you mean? You wanna use some proteins as resist? Uh, I think uh, it's a, it might be a problem because we first make a patterning with the resist itself and then make a shape etching or putting contacts and etc. Uh, after that. So it's, I, I mean, you cannot, for example, to change the shape of the material that you use just sending a light or electrons. Uh, yeah, that's the answer. Okay, I can add to this. 
if you want to use a protein, uh, I mean, as a photoresist for photolithography. So typically photoresist is, there are three properties. So it must be absorbing to uh, the light, uh, basically in, in the UV region, 348 nanometer or uh, 248 nanometer or 193 nanometer. And it has to cross link because then it will be hardened after it's cross linked. And then you can do the subsequent processes uh, after the uh, imaging of the pattern onto your substrate. So if uh, the protein can do all this, then of course it can be used, but if it doesn't satisfy these uh, factors, then you cannot use this because I, as far as I know, protein can, be, uh, can degrade at certain uh, wavelength of light. So there is possibility. There's also the, the, the trickiness in, in that area. I have a question. Hello, can you hear Hello. me? Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice presentation, guys. Uh, I'm wondering, can we cut, you know, the anapolymer film, very thin film or dyes, I will say, you know, the dyes without smearing. So can we see the, you know, the any embedded, you know, the particles inside, you know, the polymer film after, you know, the dicing? Uh, yes, for the dicing application, um, typically it's a, what we call is a very dirty process. So uh, basically the dicing application is not in the front end, but it's in the back end. But people in the industry uses coating before you dice. So theref therefore, if you put a coating that can be uh, soluble in water, you can, you can wash away after that. So you first coat and then you dice. So basically all these uh, particles, because it carbonized and then it lands onto your coat. You wash away the coating together with the particles. So therefore you leave the surface still clean. So that's how uh, people in the industry do that. Yeah. Uh, technically my question was, uh, if you put, you know, the sub five nanometer particles inside the polymer matrix. Yes. So from the top, you know, the wheel, uh, yes. sometimes it is, you know, the hassle to see them, but, one alternative is just, you know, the dicing or the film, and then maybe from the side view under microscope, you can probably see, you know, the, the particles inside the polymer matrix. But if it is not smearing, the, you know, the, the, you know, the surface, because, you know, if it smears there, probably you will not be able to see any particles inside, the, you know, the film, the side view of the film. So I need, you know, the kinds of seamless, nicely diced, you know, the uh, thin film of polymer composite. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a, a real like dice cut. It has to be processed in the like a reactive ion etching, patterning and reactive ion etching, and it will create you a, a, a dice material or, or etched material. Let's assume you have a, some thin film uh, in, 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 in the micron sizes, but you would like to pattern it and then you will inspect from the side view. So you can pattern with lithography and you can use some wet etchings or dry etchings to remove the unremained part of, the, of, of that sheet, which means like a cutting. Oh, right. So, and then there are some proce uh, processes and we have some special gases inside that reactive ion chambers like SF6C4FA and that gases can uh, cut your material like physically the ion bombardment on the surface or the mixture of that gases can react as a chemical reaction and remove your thin films uh, or, 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 or you can get rid of the unremained parts of your material. Great to know this, Jen. Thanks a lot. You are welcome. Evet, teşekkür ediyoruz. Zannediyorum soruların da sonuna geldik. Başka bir nano görüşmek üzere. Herkese hoşça kalın diyorum.